to suddenly. Look at this thing. The Hummer EV. Redneck visit. Today we're going to be talking about, well, I guess we could call it Hummer EV part three, or we could call it the difference between inertial mass and gravitational mass, or we could call it the frustrating tendency of everyone to oversimplify the rotational dynamics of a rig. Equivalent mass is the inertial mass of your car from the perspective of your engine. So basically, from the engine's perspective, trying to angularly accelerate all your moving parts, which then linearly accelerates your vehicle down the road, what is the mass it's having to push its force against to get your car to accelerate? That's equivalent mass. Now, if you're not interested in cars, then you probably haven't heard of this term. Even some of my physics professors have never heard of this term. When you're just cruising along and you've got a gear ratio of somewhere between overdrive and a 10 to 1, it really doesn't make all that much difference. In fact, if you go to the SAE and say, hey, how should I account for the rotational dynamics of my rig? You know, getting all my rotating parts moving. They'll just say, ah, in your calculations, multiply your mass by a factor of 1.3 and then yeah, you'll be fine. But in reality, the equivalent mass of a rig can vary wildly. If you're rock crawling, it can make you lurch all over or smooth as could be up a hill. If you just like high speed stuff, dune crashing or drag racing, it directly affects your acceleration. I mean, a 10% change in, well, the inertial mass of your rig? Uh, yeah, that's gonna make a huge difference. Now, if we look at a few really simple energy conservation equations, we can see what its formula would be. All right, so very generically, the energy in our system. You know, we're gonna have a one half mv squared for the linear kinetic, we're gonna have a one half i omega squared for that angular kinetic, and what are we looking for? Well, we're gonna be looking for the linear equivalent mass of this energy, okay? So that's what we're after. So there's gonna be a bunch of this? Let's define a ratio n, which is the relationship between the rotational velocity of some component, maybe the flywheel, to the linear velocity of the vehicle. All right, and then we know that that linear velocity of that vehicle is just gonna be the rolling radius of the tire times the rotational velocity of the tire. And then we also know how to relate the rotational velocity of that component to the rotational velocity of that tire, right? And that's by multiplying it by a gear ratio. Plugging these two equations into that first one, we can redefine n as being the relationship between the rotational velocity of the component in question to the rotational velocity of the tire to the rolling radius of the tire. So, so that's what n is gonna mean. All right, so using what we know from one and this guy right here, we're gonna come back over to our basic energy conservation. Let's substitute in our new value of omega, right? If we multiply uh, V on both sides here, then we'd have omega equals Vn. So we're gonna substitute that in here where omega is, that uh, squared gets distributed. So now we just got rid of that omega, right? We're making progress here because we wanna find one uh, linear mass equivalent. So we just made some progress. We got rid of that angular side of things. We replaced it with n, all right? And we, we know our definition of n. All right, so here we have the total energy in the system is 1 half mv squared, still our normal gravitational mass times v squared, plus 1 half i n squared v squared. And then what we see we can do from here is just rewrite a 1 half me, right? Just mass equivalent, it's just, just mass v squared over here, and that's what we're gonna be solving for. We wanna know what this me is, what the linear equivalent mass is. That's what we're after. All right, and everything's still the same right here, right? And there's some very easy simplifying. I see here we can blow up all these v squareds, all these one halves blow up. It comes down all the way to the linear equivalent mass of any particular object, which was our subject, or you could do this multiple times for multiple different components along the drivetrain and add them up, is equal to the gravitational mass, this, this original linear mass all the way up here, plus 
i n squared. So that's a fancy way of saying what is our linear equivalent mass. And there we have it. That's nice and simple. It's pretty easy to find the moment of inertia of something. It's pretty easy to know the rolling radius of your tire. And it's pretty easy to know the gear ratio of whatever uh, rotating body you're talking about to the final output rotational velocity, which is your tire's RPM. And, and there we have it. We have it. We can find the equivalent linear mass of any component or the sum of all our components. How would an increased gear ratio, or maybe shifting into low range, affect a vehicle's ability to accelerate? According to, well, Newton's second law, F equals MA, how is our vehicle's ability to accelerate, this A right here, going to be affected by the gear ratio increasing? Okay? Is it going to go down or up? Well, we know that force will be, the wheel force, will be increased by an increased gear ratio simply because all we need to do to find wheel torque is just multiply the crankshaft torque by the gear ratio. That tells us the wheel torque. And then we just say, well, torque equals force times radius. And then we know the wheel force. So we know that as gear ratio increases, the wheel torque will increase linearly, right? Because it's just something times something. And then we divide by the radius. And so force will increase as gear ratio increases. So yes, force does go up. But what about the mass part here? Well, okay, our equivalent linear mass is the gravitational mass plus I n squared. Well, what's n? Remember, from our other equations, we know that n is just the gear ratio over the rolling radius of the tire. So as the gear ratio increases, it's gonna get squared. So it's gonna get an even bigger, 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 bigger mass as it goes along. <clears throat> Please. Let's look at it graphically. If we have gear ratio on the x-axis, and we have torque for starters on the y-axis, that's just going to be a nice y equals x line, OK? And then if we go ahead and also plot the equivalent mass on the y-axis, then we're going to have a y equals x squared kind of curve. Because remember, it's g over r squared. So there's an interval, namely from 0 to 1, that the y equals x curve yields larger values than the y equals x squared curve. That's just because any number that's between 0 and 1, when it's squared, will end up being a smaller number. When you're in a certain range of gear ratios, it's as if, and it's true, an increase in gear reduction leads to an overall gain in ability to accelerate. But as soon as you start to get past that 10 to 1-ish mark, the y equals x squared really starts to dominate. And you start to get ratios of your gravitational mass to your linear mass that are much, much higher than even a 1.5 or 1.3, like the SAE suggests, to 1. Uh, by the time you get into a low range in almost any truck, you're dealing with maybe four to one ratios, meaning the ratio of your equivalent mass to your gravitational mass, I don't know how you, uh, MG looks weird, is greater than one. The SAE says 1.3 says it all, but it ends up climbing and climbing because of that n squared. And you can end up with ratios that are like 30. By the time you get to a crawl ratio that you'd find in like a Ford Bronco, the equivalent mass of the flywheel alone on that thing is 60, 70,000 pounds. I know that's not mass, but I'm assuming you're near sea level. That's incredible. 70,000 pounds. We're talking about an 18 wheeler going down the road from the perspective of your engine. That's how much the flywheel weighs. Hello? Yeah. But let's bring the conversation back to why we might have called it Hummer EV part three. What's the biggest difference in your mind when you think of an electric vehicle versus its internal combustion counterparts. Well, electric vehicles are a lot worse for the environment, yeah. And they also have, well, much lower moments of inertia. They don't have very much rotating mass. They don't have flywheels. They don't have drive shafts. In some cases, they don't even have axles. I mean, the Lordstown Endurance is literally like the outside of the motor is the wheel. So all that to say, they don't have very much stuff to get moving when you hit the pedal, right? And that's one of the reasons why they're great going zero to 60. Now, another thing that electric vehicles are really into right now is they're addicted to single speed gearboxes. 
save some heavy industrial uses and uh, a couple awesome little prototypes like the Jeep Magneto, everybody is a one speed. All right, so what does that mean? Well, you gotta have a lot of motor power to crack it loose and launch off the start if you wanna feel like you got a low end and you end up overspooling yourself by the time you get to the top end, especially if you're going Tesla high performance, going like 200 miles an hour. So there's some give and takes there. But anyways, electric vehicles have single speed gearboxes that have to be good enough for low and high, and they have low moments of inertia. So those two things combined give you a great mid-range zero to 60 kind of wow launch off there. But let's bring electric back to the world of rock crawling. Is it a good thing to be heavy? I mean, it's not really heavy, right? Because you still have the same amount of gravitational mass. Your normal force isn't increasing. It's not increasing anything about how other objects interact with you, except for from the perspective of your engine, your inertial mass, how much effort you have to put in to move yourself is higher. It, why is that a good thing? Or, or is it a bad thing? I mean, obviously for acceleration, it's always a bad thing. You, you wanna be able to change your motion rapidly. But if you have the inertial mass of a dump truck, that's not gonna happen. So is this a good or bad thing in rock crawling? Well, what do you want in rock crawling? You want very much smoothness. You want the ability to keep moving forward without lurches. Right, that's why people like torque converters when they're rock crawling. I know there's still a few people that love their clutches, but by and large, what do torque converters provide? They provide a lot of feathering ability, a lot of, ooh, just enough to overcome it, but not to spin it, right? Because on a hard packed surface, or basically on rock or asphalt, you do not want wheel slippage, because as soon as you do that, now you can only have as much traction as your kinetic um, friction coefficient, whereas that static coefficient will always be greater, pretty much. So you don't want to have lurchy motions, okay? And having a large equivalent mass, well, that means that for a given amount of input, of energy, of power, there's not going to be all that big in change of motion. And so it basically is like a throttle response that filters out all the little noise, like on some of the um, drive-by wires, you know, all the side-by-sides now they don't just have a cable running to your throttle plate opening and closing because when you're trying to go smooth over little obstacles you'll end up just kind of uh, 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 and it lurches right and so you filter that kind of noise out and so basically equivalent mass is doing that a different way doing the same thing you weigh so much that regardless of how much throttle you give it to an extent you're not going to ever get a lurch out of it so in that sense, we would want a lot of equivalent mass to tone us down, to essentially tone our engine down, to take out that noise that we get from that bouncy pedal kind of feel. So we don't want lurchiness. So this is sounding like equivalent mass is a good thing in rock crawling. We need a lot of lot of torque. And so we're not actually losing torque. We still have more torque than ever before available to us. It really is getting multiplied through that whole crawl ratio, right? I mean, if you're in a Marlin crawler, you know, you're having well over 100,000 pound-feet of torque available to you. So yes, you could pull all the more trains behind you, but because of that IN squared, that equivalent mass growing even faster than just the torque you have available to you is growing, you couldn't accelerate very quickly. You'd be uh, losing the ability to accelerate quickly as you got the ability to pull more. It's kind of a weird thing. It sounds like a paradox. How can you have more pulling power and yet less ability to accelerate? And yet it's true. That's, that's the whole idea of equivalent mass. I was just talking as if the only way that you could get control was by having a wimpier engine. The only way you could have smoothness was by having a lack of power uh, or having so much gear reduction that even the most powerful engine feels like a slug. But electric cars, they don't have that gear reduction. So are they guaranteed to be jerky? Are they guaranteed to be lurchy? Especially because of the lack of uh, back EMFs at zero RPM, they really have a surge right there. Well, not necessarily. Because of how much control you can have over an electric motor, it's not just like, how much air should we let in? How much fuel should we let in? Bam, like an engine. They have more control over it. They could, theoretically, 
have that same smoothness, that same slowness to alter your motion that a gas engine would get from having a phenomenally long gear train just from good programming, just from software that tells it nice and slow, just like a marlin crawler. I'm gonna keep talking about marlin crawler because, I mean, look, you can literally get out of the rig and just like watch it drive up a hill. I mean, that's different. But you can get that same thing without the gear reduction, theoretically, in an electric vehicle. And that's why it is a pretty cool concept. I mean, I think that's the idea behind the Hummer EV's low range, which is not a low range gear reduction. It's just a somehow, I guess, an attempt, basically, at doing what I'm saying. Have they done it successfully yet? I, I don't think so. I mean, so far, their traction control systems, like the Rivian, you're saying that is the holy grail of all wheel drive systems? Sorry, engineering explained. I think you want to rethink that one. But anyways, they're going to get better. That's why I don't want to reel on it too much. It's because they'll figure it out someday. Because there is a way to get an electric motor through software to behave as if it had millions and bazillions of pounds of equivalent mass behind it, even though it doesn't. So I think they do have hope. Thanks for watching Redneck Physics.